Hello. Here we are back on Facebook Live. What a day. I hope you've had a, a less eventful day than me, or if it's been eventful, that they've been good events. Ah, a struggle for at least one of you as well. <laughs> Have you ever had uh, one of those auditions where you get to the hall basically right at the last minute and, um, you know, your plan was to get there. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, your plan was to get there like three hours early and get the good parking and walk into the hall and, you know, get your warm up room and all that. And instead you're like, you know, you skid it on the snow on the way there and you get there at the last minute and you barely get the warm up room and you realize you didn't bring your snack or any of that. Um, oh yeah, stand partners for life t-shirt. Um, getting some more of these made up <laughs> in case anybody else wants to be a stand partner. Um, I like it. Um, yeah, so today I was filming an, a donor thank you video for the LA Phil. Very important to thank, the, to thank those that make our work possible and um, then, you know, got back here and the water was out in the house and the power was off and everything else, but miraculously, camera, lights, mic, everything is good. So we are ready to, ready to talk, um, practice techniques. And um, first of all, a big thank you to all of you for being here today. And um, especially if any or all of you were uh, here over the last two days. This is our third day of live sessions and um, Monday, of course, we talked about practice mindset and all the decisions you make before you put the bow to the string. Uh, yesterday talked about tools, the tools that we need to find and refine in order to play all the rep that we want to play. And today is going to be practice techniques. How exactly do we spend our time in the practice room? You know, how do you put together a daily routine? And then how do you solve some of those technical problems or even musical problems that uh, bedevil us? And always with an eye toward that performance because this, this whole practice method, practice system is called a practice makes performance. You don't have to be performing every day of the year in order to practice this way. It helps to have some kind of performance goal, even if that's just, um, I just got a note from someone who said, the only person I play for is my wife in the house. And that's perfect. So you can still practice with an eye toward playing for her. Um, I've often done shows at, uh, you know, libraries or uh, retirement homes, or for some it might maybe churches or, or what have you, but you can always make those performance opportunities and those are so great to move you forward um, not only because it's wonderful to share your your gifts and your hard work with other people but also it gives you that end date that goal at the end um, that you can aim for and you can turn all your practicing toward that um, and if you did miss the last couple days never fear you can always watch them later here on Facebook. And uh, if you prefer, they also will be on my website. If you get my regular emails, you, uh, you've seen the links to those. Um, so these sessions will live on. But you guys are really making the sessions what they are because you know it's wonderful. We can inter interact live and, and I can uh, see what you're thinking and answer your questions. Um, and at the end of today's session, I'm gonna leave some time to share with you my thoughts for where I'd like to take this once today is over. Um, Cause it's, it's been a great two days. I'm certain today is gonna be a lot of fun too. And then I'm gonna take things in a, a little bit of a different direction for those of you that might wanna continue working with me on these things. Um, so I'll leave some time at the end for that. Now for some reason, it has switched me to some kind of congressional hearing and I'm not sure why. So let me just make sure that my connection is still. Well,
Well, it's not liking my internet connection. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> I got replaced by, by a bunch of guys in suits talking. Okay. Well, like I said, it's been one of those days. I'm going to hope that that does not happen again. Um, good. All right. Well, I was just saying that at the end of today, I'm going to leave a little time to let you know where I'm going to take this discussion and, and uh, this, this work after today is done. Um, share with you a, a chance to work with me further on these kind of things, on practicing making your performance. Um, so I'll leave some time for that at the end. And um, I do want to start with a little bit of a story. I know if you've um, if you found this live stream because of my emails, I told you about when I got my first job in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and how that um, you know led me to have to develop a, some kind of real practice method rather than just all the random stuff I'd done before or whatever other people had told me to do. Um, now I'd like to take it much more recently, um, actually once I had already gotten to LA and you know things were good and I've, I've certainly enjoyed success in, in auditions and all that. Um, and so I was asked to make some videos and this was for a teaching company and you know put together some kind of curriculum made up of pieces and uh, a few fundamental skills and uh, then we thought it might be good to throw some etudes in there too and I was a little bit embarrassed because it had been so long uh, since I had you know really looked at those etude books um, I'd kind of practice technical exercises now and then if I felt like something wasn't right. But, you know, to really open up the Kreitzer book, for example, and to um, take a real look at it, um, I hadn't done that in a while. So I uh, decided which ones I was going to record and got out the book and started playing them. I thought, you know, okay, these are the etudes I learned when I was a kid, so it'll be just fine to, um, fine to whip through these and record them. And uh, they were really hard. <laughs> I started trying to play, you know, I think Kreitzer two, I sort of had in my bones so I could play that. But even the very first one with the long bows and that crescendo and all of that, I thought, you know, my bow changes didn't feel right. I wasn't, you know, I thought it was okay until I come time to record it you know I didn't love that shift how is that going to sound and it just got worse from there all those Kreitzer etudes um, had their challenges and I thought what, what am I even going to say about these um, you know I, I have some idea what these are for but it's been so long since I learned them when I was a kid um, what am I going to share with folks and um, so I had to go back um, I asked my old teachers I did some reading. There wasn't so much to watch back then. Um, and one by one, I got the point of what each of those Kreitzers were. And we talked a little bit yesterday about a, a few etudes specifically. Um, and then as I got to practicing them with an eye toward what each one was about, I felt my hand change. Um, not just Kreitzer, but the Schreidek. The All of those, seeing how the fingers lifted and placed and just looking into things that I hadn't thought about for a good long time. And as I said, I could feel the shape really of my hand change. Um, all of a sudden notes started feeling like they just, they lay right under my fingers rather than me having to search for them. My hand got faster, which I didn't think was going to be possible at age 30 something. <laughs> you know, I thought, I had always heard, okay, you're get your fastest fingers when you're 16 and then after that you know everything goes downhill you're never going to be that fast again and that hasn't been true you know working on these etudes gave me more facility and I just thought what a shame that I've waited so long but you know it's never too late to to change that anyway made the recordings 
um, which now aren't online anymore. But I always thought, you know, I'd like to do those again, get another crack at them now that I know how they help people. Because the truth was a few folks um, looked at the etude videos, but in the end, um, they weren't super popular. Um, I think because I hadn't done a, a great job of letting people know how much they had helped me. Um, but now that I get another chance at them and, and I see, you know, how much the etudes mean to, to you guys as well, um, that's what got me thinking along these lines um, to, to do these live sessions. Um, so, oh, hi. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, today, I'm going to talk about practice techniques and um, building off that idea of succeeding in your practice so that you, you take those steady steps toward the performance. Um, how do you really solve problems? Let's take a look again at that first page of the Mendelssohn Concerto as an example. Um, we talked a little bit, oops. talk a little bit, tune a little bit. Talked about that first shift and how I might repeat that quite a few times, um, always in a way that I can hear the guide note and be sure of dropping that finger just where it needs to be. Um, and I talked as well about not rushing ahead to, to join that up with everything else, that that can come later. So to do it at a tempo where that feels great, sounds great, or acceptable anyway. And then, um, and then perhaps moving on. So I'm going to skip ahead maybe to a place that has difficulty for a lot of people. Uh, about here. So if we want performance tempo. That place right there. Now, how are some ways that that might not be sounding great right in the beginning? Perhaps that those aren't so even. Or perhaps the string crossings introduce a little bit of a delay. Or maybe it's the shifts that are messing up intonation. Could be anything. Um, let's pretend that it's just not even. And so then we'll get to one of my favorite go-to practice techniques, which is note grouping. And it's also sometimes known as dotted rhythms, although I'll tell you why I prefer note grouping. So probably everybody's done some kind of dotted rhythm practice in the past. And I have made a separate video on this note grouping that you can check out later for more on this. But the reason I call it note grouping rather than just dotted rhythms is dotted rhythms kind of make it, you know, there's a long note and a short note. And that's great. That's already helpful. That'll even us out a little. But when you really think about note grouping, the next group is a group of two notes, second and third finger. So they're going to go down almost simultaneously as a group, as a unit. So that you almost can't hear that second finger. Now that's a long stretch from just doing a dotted rhythm. One, two, three. Here's one unit. The next two notes, two, one. I'm also going to treat those like a unit. That means that three and two are going to lift almost simultaneously. This way the notes come so quickly without any effort. I'm really just lifting once. Now that's a quick shift. I do that as quick as I can. I do, I do still try to think of 2-1 as a unit. And then again. 
Next, I'm going to do the groups starting the other way around. So rather than having the first note long, the, fir the first two notes are going to be the group. So in this variation, the three is just barely going to touch the string. The two now is just barely going to lift. So so always groups of two. When you've got groups of two, you've got two ways you can do it. When you have groups of three, you've got three ways you can do it, etc. Usually even just doing groups of two is so, it's helpful enough and freeing enough for the hand that, that that almost always solves the problem. But depending on the pattern, you may want to do three or even four. Believe me, I've spent uh, hours and hours in my life having fun with this. I consider that sort of thing fun. So you may find that the fingers almost want to move too fast after that. Um, Another approach to solving that sort of thing is to look at an etude that might be an equivalent. The, the Schreidek, those first three pages of Schreidek are so great for that um, with patterns like that. Or you could make up your own pattern. Um, and this is sometimes an important thing to do if you're getting frustrated, if you're getting stuck with a piece. Sometimes it's not great to spend a whole lot of time on that passage playing it in a way that frustrates you. Sometimes you want to lift the difficulty out of that and put it into an exercise or an etude or something that you make up so that you're not associating the notes of the piece with frustration, with difficulty. Work on it externally, then import it back into the piece. Um, let me see. Uh, I wonder if you have a favorite go-to practice technique um, doesn't have to be for Mendelssohn, could be anything. I've just mentioned note grouping and taking it outside of the piece to an exercise that you make up. Let me see which uh, you have and, and see what your questions may be too. References, so uh, Benjamin asked, are there any references that point someone to certain etudes that correspond to certain pieces? Um, I have a quick answer for you, at least regarding orchestra excerpts. Um, and that, I, I've republished that on my site. I didn't write that guide. That was written by Stephen Ships, uh, who used to teach at the University of Michigan. And he put together an equivalent guide, orchestra excerpts, etudes that correspond. Um, I don't have the answer right away for you uh, on that regarding concertos and things like that. Um, I mean, on a case-by-case -case basis, I can think of passages and pieces that correspond to etudes. I mean, that's one of my favorite things to, to do. Um, this passage in the Mendelssohn, I had mentioned uh, Schreidek, but also Kreutzer 9, the... with the finger patterns and quick lifting and, and dropping would be a perfect complement to that. Um, yes, and... Uh, Here's a question about the leather in the bow to have a better grip. I do place my thumb on the leather. Rather, that's a little bit of a change. When I was growing up, I had it. I had my thumb either on the ebony of the bow or like in the space in between the ebony and the leather. And not only uh, did I, you know, I'd get dents in my thumb from that, but um, also that can wear away the wood if you've got a bow that costs some money. That's a pretty vulnerable place in the bow. Um, and if you'll see old bows, a lot of times they have little dents worn in the wood after a hundred years of people's thumbs going in there. So I always have my thumb on the leather instead. Leather's there to protect the bow. So it's more for that reason than, than grip necessarily. Um, now, um, Mozart 39, the fourth movement. Um, whenever I try to think of what equivalent etudes would be for a piece or an excerpt, I always 
first decide what the, the chief difficulties are. So the fourth movement of Mozart, 39th Symphony, for those who haven't studied it, is an introductory passage in piano and then in forte. <laughs> Then the same in forte, so I use a little more bow. And then uh, transitions into <laughs> a difficult passage with lots of string crossings. So. For me, and for the majority of people I see who have a little difficulty with that excerpt, it's about the string crossings and how to get a great sound on three or even four different strings when you're crossing rapidly between them. And one thing that many people don't think about with that is that the contact points on those different strings are different. So moving the bow here on the E string, maybe here. And so as you go to the lower strings, the bow has to move further out. But that's not all. <laughs> if you're moving the bow slowly on the G string, like... Then this may be a fine contact point where you see me now. If I keep the bow there and move it fast, it's not even close to an acceptable sound. It's super ponticello, super bridge sound, right? I've, I would have to move quite a bit out. Now these are gut strings, so especially they don't like being pressed right next to the bridge for the most part. I'm almost on the fingerboard now to have a good solid G string sound with a fast bow. So when I'm playing that passage with all the string crossings, I'm constantly adjusting the contact point of my bow based on the string. <laughs> Once you've done that enough, your ear will be your guide, and that will inform where that bow moves. So, therefore, any etudes with uh, great lots of string crossings, um, you know, Kreutzer 8 comes to mind. Um, don't... Oh, I'm blanking on the number now, but it's the, maybe number 2. Uh. That also has the advantage of mixing slurs and separate notes, which the Mozart features as well. But if you pick an etude with string crossings and it doesn't have slurs, you can just add them. So, or, or even three. To get comfortable with the different string levels while the bow is moving fast. Um, Good, and Soho asks, how would you approach the problem you don't know what to do with? Um, and I've said it over the last two days too, you know, when you reach the limit of your knowledge and your creativity, I mean, we all have to be detectives really when we look to solve these problems, but when you reach your limit, you go for outside help and um, you find someone with even more experience um, and that maybe there's a video online that, that inspires you and takes you in a different direction. Um, maybe you know a teacher or a colleague. Um, and then, you know, I've helped lots of people over the years from this studio. Um, but yeah, that's tough. I mean, that's why we go to a teacher, right? Because uh, for those things that we know how to work on ourselves, there's so much you can do on your own. It's only when you reach your, your limits that you need that help. Um, good, and Ragna says, and I'm sorry if I'm saying your name incorrectly, sometimes I turn everything around, playing opposite bowings, playing only in the lower half of the bow, using other fingerings, and that is all wonderful too. What I like about that too, for example, reverse bowings, that is a great technique. Reverse bowings can often sound better than the original. <laughs> I'm going to give you an example. Um, the one I'm thinking of is, for example, in the, the Schumann Scherzo that often just gets played to death, you know, the same way, same way, same bad habits. Um, 
and I'm slowing it down a little. Some people have a stroke where the down bow is always heavier than the up bow. And of course, that's not ideal for a piece like that. And so you can hear that it's messing up the rhythm a little bit and I'm getting all those down bow accents. If I make myself do it with a reverse bowing, somehow it evens things out because now the down bows are on the weak beats and somehow mentally and physically my body doesn't want to accent them anymore. So it lets me hear how the piece probably should be shaped. Having heard that, I can then go back to the real bowing and compare it. And often that's enough to solve the problem. So I think reverse bowing is a great technique. Um, let me see, last comments and questions here. Um, so Alderman has tried grouping notes, but you're not too patient. Um, you know, patience is a good thing, um, but sometimes impatience is a sign that we're not really going in the, in the right direction, not going in a way that helps us. Um, what I would encourage you for anyone who's trying the note grouping technique is truly to think of, to, to take time on the long note. Don't rush off the long note and think that you have to do this complicated pattern. Or You've got to give yourself time, plan your next move, f almost feel in advance those next two fingers moving as a unit or the next three fingers moving as a unit. Take all the time you need on the long note. That's the whole point of this technique is to start feeling fingers or strings even working together as a unit. Um, and can you do that no matter your age? With that, I assume you mean, you know, make these changes, make the improvements. Absolutely. Um, and that's one of my strong beliefs, by the way, um, is that you can, you know, it's true. I, if we try to think of a, a major world famous soloist that started after age, you know, 10 or 12, that's going to be a rarity uh, if we can even think of one. So, you know, for whatever reason, kids learn quicker. We know that. Um, but kids also have limitations as well. And I think, you know, for every year we gain an age, um, we gain also in wisdom and experience that can stand in our way if we're not open to new ideas. But it does not limit us physically. As I said, you know, I had fast enough fingers when I was a teenager but they're faster now and they're more accurate now. And there are any number of changes that I've made over the years and that I've seen and helped other people make too. Um, and how do you do it? I mean, you look at what is, look at what could be, and then figure out the path from one to the next. It's, it doesn't have to be super difficult. You just make slow and steady progress in the right direction. So yes, any age. Um, good. We've got a lot of great questions. Um, before I get back to more specific questions, I, I want to talk a little bit more about practice techniques and organizing your time, maybe take us in the direction of a daily routine. Um, and the first thing I always think about is I don't necessarily want one routine. I think it's great to to keep a routine for a little bit, um, maybe that's a week, maybe it's two weeks, but then always to switch it up for many reasons. Um, for any of you who have spent time in the gym working out, you know that there's always, there always comes a point where you plateau. So, you know, if you're running and you always do the same kind of training, you will eventually hit your limit as far as how fast you can run, how far you can run. And so any good training program switches these things up so that you can keep making gains. And the same is true on the violin. Um, weight training, you can't just keep doing the same bench press and expect to keep gaining in the same way. You change the angle, maybe it's an incline or a decline press, maybe you're working with dumbbells and then the next is the bar. Could be anything. Um, but in general, 
scales, some kind of scales have to be part of a daily routine. They won't be the same scales all the time, but I, that's I do every day. Um, everyone always asks about how much practice and how much, you know, of what goes into it. The amount of time you practice in a day, that will tell you how much repertoire you can handle, really. Um, if you are practicing for professional orchestra auditions, it's hard to get by with much less than three hours, unless you've auditioned on every one of the pieces on the list before and you're just kind of maintaining good foundation, good technique, and, and brushing up on a few of the tough parts. But it's tough to get by in much less than three hours a day. And, you know, similar if you're putting together a recital program, two, three hours a day, you know, that lets you look in detail at one piece and then play some of the rest and leaves time for scales and exercises and all that. But let's say that you have two hours in a day because, you know, a lot of days I don't even have that now. What with the, the kids and the job and, and all of that. But let's say I have two hours that I can carve out. They won't be necessarily in one stretch. Um, and I won't always start with the scales either. But sometime in those two hours, I would probably do at least 20 minutes of scales. And I talked much more in detail about that yesterday, what scale practice means for me. But I, uh, depending on how much time I have, I'll do two or three keys in a day and then switch those keys the, every day. Um, for those who haven't done as many scales, maybe you do one key a day and stick with it for a few days. That's up to you. Eventually you switch keys so that you're moving through all 24. Um, I do my scales with three different bow strokes. So just separate detaché, the same off the string because it that affects the timing, the coordination between the two hands. And then slur. Go. Um, arpeggios and some double stops. I would pro if I had two hours, I would probably spend 20 minutes on scales. And then I might pick just one or two etudes or exercises um, that interest me or, or, or that work on a specific weakness that I've noticed. Trills are something, for example, that need fairly constant maintenance. So I do some kind of trill work almost every day. The Kreitzer etudes in the teens have a lot of those. Uh, uh, um, that's a fourth finger trill one, um, but uh, trills and trill endings, those need maintenance, um, and they're so good for playing in general. So, and my wife has annoyingly good trills. So I always have to try to live up to those. Um, and then that would, might leave me an hour and a half for repertoire, which I think is, that's a great mix. It gives me a chance to play through some things and then to really take apart specific passages. Um, now let me, let's see, Daniel asks, is it bad that you only change the scales once a week? No, it's not bad. Um, it's great to get to the point, what, what I might do instead of just keeping one key every day for a week, if you did two keys a day, the same two keys a day for a week, and see what you get out of that. Because then what can be nice, is, first of all, is that you can alternate between them. You don't have to do, you know, 15 minutes of C major and 15 minutes of A minor or something. You can, go, you can be going back and forth between them. Um, it just helps open up the ear and gives you a fresher perspective more often because let's say that you are playing something the slightest bit out of tune I'm exaggerating I mean we can all hear that's out of tune but let's say that you were if you're now alternating to go to a minor those A's are going to be really fresh in your ear so that when you go back, well, then that really sticks out. 
and it's an easy correction and it doesn't get baked in. Um, so I like to do, you know, if I'm doing my three keys, I might do the single note scales in all the keys, then all the arpeggios in the three keys, then the double stops. It just depends on the day and what I feel like my, my ear needs. So maybe doing the same two keys a day for a week. And if you have more time for scales, when you progress to the point where they go a little faster for you, you might be able to do two keys for just three days and then switch. So nothing's bad. All, any scales are better than no scales. Um, you may get more out of it the more keys you can do. Um, all right, these are some, some more good questions. How do I practice Shridic? Um And this is a great question regarding subject too, because you know, these days, I think authors of books and um, you know etudes and exercises are more aware that human beings are reading them and playing them and so there's more of an effort to to give the why and you know this is what you do and this is how you do it um, back in the old days it was the custom just to sort of I don't want to say vomit out like 50 pages of <laughs> repetitive <laughs> things but you know the it was assumed that you had a teacher you were working with and that this teacher would probably pick from among the 50 pages. And so Shridek and especially Sevjek are just written with all these repeats and, you know, you do this up in all the positions on the string and you, you, then there's a repeat sign and it's slurred a bunch of notes. So one of the common faults I see for practicing Shridek, for example, that first one is that they have these long slurs. And um, I'll, I'll see someone play the Shridek, and their fingers aren't moving quite that fast, which is fine. They're at a slower tempo, but they try to keep that bowing. Uh, and now the sound is terrible because there's <laughs> the bow is so slow. You know, forget the slurring. Change bows wherever you need so the... so that your sound and the way your fingers work are determining the bowing. So that's one thing. And, you know, you don't have to go with the repeat signs. Play it once if you like. Play it ten times if you're getting more out of it. Um, but, you know, for myself, now that I have gotten past the difficulties of the different variations in that first Shridek, I like to play it through at whatever tempo I can. I usually don't do the repeats. Um, and what I pay special attention to is where the pattern changes. Uh, so right where the pattern turns around, that's where I pay special attention to see if I'm even. And if there's any unevenness there, there then I might stop right there. I may play through the whole thing, but remember where I had my little baubles, and then I'll go back and play those slowly. Subject the same. You don't have to play on in all seven positions the same shifting pattern on all four strings. That's going to take you 15 minutes, and then you've only practiced one kind of shift. Um, I know, Anita, you're going to have a great question here. Some performers seem to have a superhuman ability to play unfailingly in tune, and every shift is perfect. I want to meet these people. Um, is there something else beyond careful practice, um, a sense that is keenly developed? Is there a way to develop this internal map of the fingerboard that there is no doubt where every note is? Um, yeah, <laughs> there is. Um, funny you should ask, but there is, it, it is a combination of, of things. And yes, when you, when you mention sort of a, just a sixth sense, um, you know, it's not too mystical, but it does, of course, involve other senses besides touch. Um, it's a combination of touch and hearing, right? You know, it was said that, or Heifetz supposedly said, I don't play better in tune than anyone else. I just adjust more quickly. Um, and that is a very important part of, of playing at the very highest level, not necessarily adjusting a finger 
after it goes down and you hear that it's out of tune, but developing that sense of where the finger is about to fall and adjusting before it goes down. You don't want to be doing that on every note in the end. Um, ideally, you're, while you're developing that sense on a parallel track, you're also developing, yes, that map of the fingerboard. Um, and that comes with repeated exposure to all the different positions and to the different patterns within each position. So if I were to organize this better, I would say to know where all the notes are on the fingerboard, you first want to have a lot of experience playing in all the positions. So one of the quickest ways to develop that is to play something that would normally be in a low position and to take it to a different string where it's four positions higher. So let's say that I take Kreutzer two, and that for now I'm not going to use open strings. All well and good. Now I want those exact same pitches on the D string in fifth position. Obviously the, the spaces are going to be a little closer together and that's exactly what I want to get familiar, familiar with. So I, I alternate back and forth. Now are the pitches exactly the same? I think my G was higher. So you can see how quickly this develops the ear and at the same time the fingers. And now I'm playing a lot in fifth position. And if you're playing repertoire that puts you even higher on the fingerboard, you knew that was coming next. And again, alternate between those three strings. Now I've mapped out quite a big portion of the fingerboard. One more thing that goes along with that before I forget is that you have to get used to points of reference. Um, and those are going to be partly physical, like fourth position for me. That's where I hit the rib of the instrument. So that's a physical point of reference. Also, it means something to my fingers, the spaces between the notes. But when I shift around, when I move between the positions now, I don't do it blindly. I don't just hope I'll land in the right place. I've got points of reference. So when I shift, I use guide notes in my practice and even in the performance. You won't always hear the guide notes depending on the timing of the shift. I leave fingers down. Um, that surprises some people that come to work with me. Um, they think that, you know, that's just for kids or something. Like, you shouldn't need that if you really know where the notes are. No, I know where the notes are because my fingers stay on them. <laughs> so the notes lie right under my fingers. I once heard it said, this is a little bit like what you were saying. I once heard it said about a famous soloist. Um, she forgot how to play out of tune. And it's an interesting way of thinking about it. It's like, if this is how your fingers look and this is how they are above the string, then those are the notes you're going to play. And in a different position, Here's the shape. Um, if it's a major third, they're shaped like this. If it's a minor third, they're shaped like that. And those are all the things you can work on individually. And of course, you bring them into the pieces as well. So it's the a few senses at once, physical, touch, and hearing working together, plus that sort of sixth sense that you were mentioning the ability to know, to feel what's about to happen, and to make changes as necessary. Um, good, I'm going to, especially because we got started late, I want to answer a couple more good questions, and then I want to talk about my thoughts going forward. Um, hi, Isaiah. <laughs> um, Isaiah and I have worked together in real life, IRL, as they say. Let's say that the bow is not necessarily the main problem. Do you have some suggestion about working on the left hand without the bow in some pieces, such as Schumann Scherzo? And 
Yes, actually, one of the things about developing that sixth sense of knowing what's about to happen um, comes from doing this kind of work that Isaiah is talking about. So let's say we have the Shimon Scherzo. If I play it without the bow, and I'm, I don't have to hammer my fingers down to, to hear what the notes would really be, I just play as I would play. I do it silently. There's a lot of information I can get from that. I can, without the bow now, without the distraction of hearing the sound, I can start to feel all kinds of things like, huh, that wasn't smooth. Huh, that half step doesn't feel close enough. Hmm, maybe I, you know, I lifted that finger and maybe that should stay. And then when things are feeling pretty good, I imagine the pitches as they would come out. And then finally I bring the bow back to it to compare, to see are those the pitches that are coming out. Ha, huh, you know this, the D wasn't where I expected. Let me take the bow away again. How do I think it'll sound? And now... So immediately I'm building a closer connection between what I feel and what I hear. I'm seeing where they match up and where they don't. So that would be one example of what to do. Um, let me see. Yes, and Gavinier, for example, uh, etudes have a lot of this staying up in a high position across strings. Any etude, and you know, you, you don't have to find a specific etude for this, you can take any etude and play it in one position. If I go back to Kreitzer 8, for example, um, the beginning of it. Second position. Already I'm hearing some notes that didn't match my first position notes. So those are the kind of things that, that would refine my positional awareness. Um, all right. Good. Uh, Yoast etudes, no, I, I haven't, um, I haven't <laughs> done many of those. I was just talking about Yoast, though, though, and how I hadn't, how I missed that. Um, but, great, I think, I think I will finish with a, a question from Daniel. Tips and ways to work on interpretation, style, shape, phrasing, specifically with a Mozart concerto, and um, that's a lot of things, but I think we can safely all put that with, you know, musical interpretation. What do you want the audience to hear? And there's two parts to that, right? You have to know what you're going for. You have to have a, a plan. Um, and then you have to see how your current playing compares to that. Um, let's take near the beginning of, well, the second entrance of Mozart, fourth concerto with the... Already, there's been a lot of up and down. Uh, you know, what's my plan? And I don't think it's too much to make a Xerox of your, of your piece and mark it up with lots of crescendo, diminuendo. Could be breath marks, dots on certain notes. Be your own editor. You know, most of the editions that we learned from as kids were terribly marked up with, well, some were well marked up, others were terribly marked up with all kinds of dots and dashes that weren't there in the original. But you can be your own editor. Put it in for yourself in pencil. You can always change your mind. You can always make another Xerox. We know some things about the grammar of Mozart, right? In a tour, you almost always go toward it. Maybe this third time, I don't want to just... This, maybe this one continues. And so then I simply, I'll record myself and see if that's what's coming out. So I'm imagining that I'm playing... But let's, you know, put the money where the mouth is, make a recording and see if that's what I'm doing. And if I just hear... Then... 
I know I'm not following my own plan. So then it's usually not, you know, a horribly difficult thing to figure out what to do. I thought I was making a crescendo on those first two notes. I wasn't. So what's one of the things that can make a crescendo is speeding up the bow and a dim the reverse. Ah, so now I'm distributing the bow a little bit differently. It was even. Now. And in tempo. And so, you know, you can get as detailed as you want with that. I think if that sort of thing is new to you, it's best to get the big picture, like to say, in this line of music, in these four bars, this is where I'm headed, and then I'm going to come back away. Um, in the next four bars, here's where I'm headed. And just to make those bigger checkpoints clear, that is enough of a task. Um, that already will make things sound stylish and intelligent. And then, of course, as those patterns get familiar to you and you know how to achieve them, then you can get more and more detailed. Um, but you have to have that plan. And don't be, you know, I don't want to say there are no bad ideas, but um, most people's problem is not that they have bad ideas, it's that they don't have any. <laughs> um, they're not willing to put something down on paper and say, here's what I'm going for. And uh, one last thought about that. I used to think, well, you know, geez, you can't do that. You can't just plan all this stuff out. That's not real music making. You know, the great soloist doesn't plan every last thing they do on stage. And that's true. Uh, but they did when they were kids. <laughs> um, they do when they're learning a new piece. Um, and then, of course, they can break the rules. The, they're strong enough that they can be spontaneous in front of people. They also perform those pieces a lot. So the first performance may be a lot more planned than we guess. The subsequent performances, you know, the sky's the limit. So don't be afraid to make a plan and to figure out how you're going to, to stick to it. Um, so I, I promise you in the beginning of this that I'd let you know what, you know, what my uh, next idea is of where to take it from here. And these three days have really been about practicing for performance. Practice makes performance, and that's the, the practice method that I developed for myself that encompasses all, all these things we've been talking about. Um, and we've run up against this idea quite a lot, too, of when you reach your own limits. Um, and so, you know, it's no secret that I love helping violinists, and that's, that's why I do what I do. And, and this sort of thing is fun for me. And also based on my experience making those videos of the etudes before and, and some other things, I've felt that there was a real need for that, that a lot of these things are, are not hard to grasp once you get the information. Um, so I have a brand new course that I'm starting. Uh, you know, in the past I've done some, some courses specifically to prepare auditions and you know those are great to really be able to focus on a list of music uh, for the goal of winning an audition but that can be limiting too because an audition you know has only one positive outcome in the end and that's to win it and you can get lots of side benefits along the way but you know there are a lot of folks that aren't taking auditions for for any number of reasons and I wanted to be able to work with any violinist that, that wants to take their playing to the next level um, and who enjoys working on all these, these kind of detailed things. Um, and, you know, I'm guessing that <laughs> since you're here and, you know, an hour later or three days later that, um, you know, you, you share those qualities with me. Um, so the name of the course is the Virtuoso Master Course. And because I love that word virtuoso, and that, that's my idea. You know, I want everything I play to have that ease. Um, yes, the security, but, but also the ease, the fun, um, the flash. You know, we, we wouldn't be violinists if we didn't sometimes like to show off. And 
so the idea is that you can get help from me um, on a regular basis over the long term. Because unlike an audition, um, you know, where you got to concentrate that work more toward the end, the Virtuoso Master course is going to be a six month program um, that starts on May 27th. That's Memorial Day here in the U.S. And it's going to be uh, quite a limited group. You know, it's going to be only for, for 10 violinists. Um, and the, the exact level, you, you don't have to be a virtuoso <laughs> to be in the course. You know, you need a working knowledge of different violin techniques. You know, if you're just starting to learn what off the string is and just starting to put together a vibrato, probably this isn't quite the right course for you. Um, but you don't have to be familiar with all these different etudes because, as I said, you know, even as recently as, you know, five years ago, there were a lot of corners there that I hadn't explored yet. Um, but the idea is that over six months we work together, um, similar to the way we've been doing over the last few days, but much more targeted toward you, obviously, because it's such a small group. And um, I'm going to share a link with you um, that will let you know more about it. Here it is. Um, and that will give you some more details on it and give you a chance to, to contact me to, to talk on the phone more about it to see if it's the right fit for you. But um, yeah, the idea is it runs for six months and it all starts with an individual sort of an individual assessment to see where you are and where you want to be in six months. I mean, it doesn't get simpler than that. Um, and the goals that you want to work toward, they could be, could be auditions. You want to be ready for auditions whenever they come up, or maybe there's a specific audition that you're thinking of taking. But it could just as easily be a recital program or several programs that you want to put together. I've already talked with a couple people. Uh, one wants to make an album by the end of six months and wants that to sound the best it can be. And um, someone else wants to put together a few recital programs of a different repertoire that they've never, really never felt comfortable learning. Those are great goals. Um, or it could just be to, to get in your best shape so that you can, you're ready to take on bigger repertoire than you thought you could. Um, so we start with that. And then our group is gonna meet uh, twice a week. And uh, one, meeting a week is going to be a studio class type thing where anybody who wants in the group can play. We ask questions, we discuss, and um, then the other meeting each week is, I always kind of felt like there should be a CrossFit or something like that for the violin. Um, so that's where I'll lead, you know, an, an hour of warm-ups and exercises that you can do right along with me. Also, we can have questions and clarifications along the way. And, you know, all these will be recorded. So, you know, just like these Facebook live sessions, if you can't make something live, you'll always be able to come back to it. So like in the case of these workouts, we change it up every week. So by the, by the end of the six months, you've got more than 20 of these hours of fun and challenging workouts that you can mix and match from then on. Um, so those are the two group meetings each week. Um, and then once a month, we meet again uh, for an hour individually so we can fine tune your daily routine. You know, we would have given you your daily routine in that very first meeting, but then how is that working for you? How is it moving you toward your goals combined with the weekly group meetings? And so that's what the, the monthly individual sessions would be for. And uh, yeah, then a in advance, you know, right from the beginning of the course, I've made videos on, you know, virtually everything we've talked about in these days, these three days, all these fundamental techniques, the different etudes, there's a video for that, and uh, nobody's seen them yet. They're just, just for uh, members of the Virtuoso Master Course. Um, so that we can always refer to along the way um, for further explanation when you need a solution to a problem, I'm there for you. Um, so I wonder if there are any questions you might have about that and, you know, check the link at your leisure. 
and you know I'm always available either via email and then also phone to to answer any questions or uh, clarify anything about this. Um, as I said, May 27 is when it's going to open, and it's just going to be for 10, 10 folks. So if you're thinking about it, go ahead and check that out right away, and uh, let's see what questions there might be right now. And um, Great, great, great. Uh, right, already there's a good question about what time the meetings will happen. You know, that's going to depend on um, who's a member of the course. And as in my prior audition courses, there were some live elements. Uh, but I checked with people to see, you know, what are good times for you and let's mix it up week to week so that, <clears throat> you know, nobody's shut out of, of every week's live sessions. Um, but that's certainly something you know, I'd want to talk about with anybody who might uh, join me for this. Um, probably there's not going to be anybody who makes every single live session, and that's why they're all recorded. So, for example, if there was a studio class you knew you couldn't make, what you might want to do is make a recording in advance, shoot that over to me before the class, and then I could play the recording during the class and me and the group could talk about it and give some feedback. That would all be recorded, and then you could check it out after the fact. So, you know, that's one way it could work. Um, audition process, uh, you know, I think rather than, rather than an audition process, what, you know, what I will have you do um, if you're interested and you want to talk with me further about it um, to see if, because I really want it to be a good fit. Um, and as I said, you don't have to be a virtuoso already to, to be in the course. Um, there's a kind of a questionnaire that I'll send anybody who's interested. And it's just to get a sense of where you are and more importantly, where you want to be. As I said, the only real minimum requirement is that you're familiar with the, the concepts and that you've had some experience working with the concepts, that you've, you've played some scales, you've played some etudes, um, you're playing some um, advanced repertoire, and that you have a good idea of what you want to be doing in six months. Um, it's going to be enough of a commitment that it's, it's just not ideal for someone who is just trying to get information. You know, it's, it's for someone that really wants to do something uh, different on the violin, but I would not say that you need to be a, a full-time professional or anything like that. Um, that's something I, I would get to know you uh, with a, a questionnaire, you know, before I knew whether it was a good fit. But it, it certainly wouldn't be an audition where you have to send in recordings or anything like that. Um, and as far as auditing the course, uh, watching and not participating, um, I would have to see what kind of interest there was in the, you know, the video portion of it. Being part of the, the classes, the live sessions, I really just want that to be for the small group. Um, I want the 10 players to, to really feel like a studio or a studio family, that we all start at the same time, finish at the same time, and that everything's kept within the group. Because if that gets opened up to you know, just anybody who wants to watch, then people don't feel comfortable sharing things as they would with just a, a tight-knit group. And that's really what I want. That, that's what interests me, is working in that way. So there might be an option to just access the video library, you know, all the concepts, all the explanations that, that we've been talking about, um, but not to participate as one of the ten. Um, so I hope that, that helps answer that. Um, all right. Well, if I don't see any more questions on the Virtuoso course now, I'm going to let you check out uh, the link whenever you like. And I'll be sending an email about that as well, of course. Um, but this will be the way to work with me for the rest of 2019. Um, I've just, 
I've freed up my schedule. I've cleared my schedule um, to focus on and this on this and those uh, ten players that are going to join me for the rest of the year because this will take us to late November 2019. Um, so. Looks like my internet connection got messed up again, so I will bid you farewell, and I'll share that link one more time. But thank you so much for joining me. It's really been a pleasure, and I hope to see you soon. And email or contact me with any questions about the Virtuoso course. All right, thank you guys so much. Bye.